Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me, Carsten and uh, Manfred. And uh, yeah, good evening uh, and yeah, good morning or simply hello to um, whatever time zone you may be in. Um, so in Germany, it's actually um, 8 p.m. right now. So um, this is what we would call um, prime time here. Um, so yeah, I'm very too happy, uh, very happy to have the spot. And um, I hope you are having a great event so far. So I enjoyed all the sessions so far that I've seen. And um, thanks for joining my session, especially on uh, stretch clustering with um, PrimeFlex for Microsoft Azure Stack HCI. Um, we've got a yeah, fully packed session, so I'd say let's get started. Um, first of all, quick um, overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, firstly, I'm going to um, introduce myself a bit and Fujitsu. And then after that, we dive right into the main part, which is about um, stretch clustering with Azure Stack HCI. And um, I brought along a couple of pre-recorded videos with me um, for my demos. Um, so we were going to be uh, watch them. And um, yeah, we look at the installation, uh, creation of volumes and VM failover, um, but also want to cover some theoretical basics and concepts first, um, at least a bit. I think Carsten did a great job in laying them out early on already. Um, if you have joined his session, if not, then I would uh, re definitely recommend to do so um, to, or to watch this later on. Um, so I want to take a look at everything from both a Windows Admin Center perspective and also um, PowerShell uh, point of view, um, which we haven't seen earlier in custom sessions, I think. And everything was um, recorded on our demo uh, systems in Munich. Um, we, we have um, newly rebuilt our demo lab there, and uh, we are happy to um, yeah, host customer demos there and also partner or demos for partners and uh, yeah, also such events as here. Um, so if you would be interested in a, in a demo on, on our systems, then um, you are free to reach out uh, to us and then uh, we can see if we can facilitate one of um, those demos. And of course, there will be some room for questions in the end. But um, yeah, now let's let's get started with the quick introduction. So first of all, um, a bit about me because I'm not as famous as uh, most of my fellow speakers here, who are mostly MVPs and uh, Microsoft PMs. So um, yeah, my name is Fabian Boske. I work uh, at Fujitsu and I'm 24 years old. Um, I've actually already been with Fujitsu for six years now. Um, so I joined in 2015, um, working with them as part of my studies. And um, yeah, now I'm working in the Technical Competence Center um, for our integrated systems um, all across Europe. Um, and basically our responsibility there is to um, look after the integrated systems from a pre and post sales point of view and help our um, mostly internal colleagues to, to do their job properly. Um, I'm responsible for the Microsoft based integrated systems, which is why I'm here today. And um, yeah, when I say systems, I mean uh, basically PrimeFlex for Storage Spaces Direct. So this is our, um, let's say, old offering based on Windows Server. And then we also have an offering based on uh, the Azure Stack HCI um, dedicated operating system, which is called PrimeFlex for Microsoft Azure Stack HCI. So with that, um, for those of you who do not know Fujitsu, I think Carsten has been wondering about uh, how to pronounce it earlier. Um, so whether you say Fujitsu or uh, Fujitsu, you can actually say both, I think. Um, just as a side note, um, the, the G in Fujitsu uh, comes from earlier days when this was a joint venture together with Siemens. So um, in Japanese, the, the uh, G uh, stands for Ejimensu, which uh, was for Siemens. So um, we are actually the um, eighth largest IT service provider in the world with customers all over the world and employ um, yeah, more than 125,000 people worldwide. 
And um, last year we actually celebrated our 85th birthday. So um, we are a company with a long tradition and um, also value long lasting and sustainable customer relationships and trying to build them. And um, yeah, being an IT service provider means uh, that we do not only sell products, but uh, we also support our customers um, with building their IT strategies and uh, in finding the, the right spot for them between on-premises infrastructure and uh, cloud offerings. So um, as an Azure system integrator, we are well suited to do so. And I think with Azure Stack HCI, we have the perfect offering here. So let's continue to talk about Azure Stack HCI in our uh, offering portfolio. Um, so as mentioned, we have two different PrimeFlex integrated systems offerings. So one based on Windows Server 2019 currently, and then in the future, um, Windows Server 2022, and uh, also one based on Azure Stack HCI, um, which we are going to talk about today. And we currently have three different um, server base units in the um, Azure Stack HCI catalog. So um, these are certified solutions. And I want to um, point your attention um, to the um, TX1330 M4 um, on the right hand side, which is well suited for yeah, remote office and branch office scenarios um, because it's yeah, pretty small and it's a tower configuration. Um, so in a branch office, you can uh, put it in a room and uh, hopefully forget about it. Um, and the um, admins from the central IT department can administer um, these servers then via Azure. Um, so from a central place. So Azure Stack HCI is a good use case here. And then the other one, um, our most popular machine, which we have certified in three different configurations. Um, the RX2540 M5 um, certified as um, hybrid solution, so SSD and HDD, then uh, to um, all flash scenarios with um, NVMEs and SSDs and uh, SSD only. Okay, but I, I do not want to go into too much detail because um, yeah, the session should be about stretch clustering. So um, let's get started with the with the main part here. So I think Carsten did a pretty good job in uh, laying out earlier why uh, we need stretch clusters and why they are surveillable. And I think also most of us working in IT know the motivation behind stretch clusters well. Um, it's basically business continuity. Um, so IT is not an end in itself. It, it is there to um, support the business, but um, obviously without IT, most businesses are likely to fail and some may not uh, even be able to, to continue their operation, their IT operation, um, since more and more processes are supported and backed by IT infrastructure. And in the, in the past weeks and months, we have seen uh, numerous examples of um, all kinds of um, disasters that's, that can, ha can be happening. Um, such as um, yeah, wildfires in California, floods in Western Germany and Belgium. And um, if I remember correctly, there was also larger power outage in Texas. And then there are hurricanes like Ida and Katrina. And uh, yeah, the list continues and probably will grow uh, in the next years with um, climate change at our doorsteps. So basically, this is what we want protection from with stretch clustering by putting parts of our clusters in different locations. So Carsten has already shown this, I believe, um, with the possible architectures, what we can do with stretch clustering or how we can set it up. Mm. On the one hand, uh, the, the left hand side, we um, have an active active configuration where um, our virtual machines are running um, in both sides. And on the right hand side, we um, have a scenario where um, the machines run only in the, uh, in the left hand side. So side one here and this one is the active side. 
and the other one acts as kind of a fallback site and in case the disaster strikes on the um, primary side, um, everything fails over to the passive side, um, which then takes over the, the operation. So this is an active passive configuration. As you can see, um, both sides um, have their own storage pool. Um, so we have a dedicated storage pool for site one and uh, one for site two. And um, that means that we um, basically have different fault domains here. Usually we defined in, in the past the, the with, with single site clusters, the, the um, default domains on a, on a node level, um, but just as a, as a recap, we can also define them on a chassis level, rack level, and what we are doing here is to define them on a um, site level. So what are the requirements for stretch clustering? Again, I'm trying not to repeat everything that Carsten has said earlier, um, but we need a minimum number of uh, nodes of two per site. So we have at least four nodes in total and we need an equal number of nodes uh, per site, obviously. Um, and talking about network uh, requirements, we, we have different points to look at. So first of all, the bandwidth. Um, there is um, no specific bandwidth um, requirement that we need to take care of, but you should always consider when designing solutions uh, for, for stretch clusters that um, on the one hand you have um, lots of um, replication traffic uh, running between the sites, so um, you want to facilitate this traffic and on the other hand um, you need to think about um, yeah, what happens in the case of a failover? Um, so all your workloads, if, if, let's say site one fails, everything moves to site two. And um, in this event, site two needs to be able to run everything um, on, on its own. So um, if you have um, yeah, lots of payload traffic, you should also consider that and um, size your um, network interfaces large enough. And then on the latency side, we um, have for synchronous replication um, round trip time requirement of less than five milliseconds. And for asynchronous replication, there is no um, hard latency recommendation or requirement. So um, that's, that's not uh, too relevant here. And then Carsten also mentioned this uh, routing is, is the topic. So um, servers in the sa same site must be in the same rack and um, only work via or communicate via layer two. Um, while the, the hosts that um, or the, the sites um, must uh, have a layer three boundary in between. So um, they, they, there must be a routed network. Um, over which the um, storage replica traffic flows. And um, another thing to um, take note of is that um, RDMA um, is only used for the traffic within one site and not for the traffic between the sites. Carsten also highlighted the uh, um, need for witness. Um, so that one must be placed in a third site. Um, so either an Azure or a file share that is reachable independently from both sites. So um, like a neutral site. Um, so yeah, file share witness could also be used here next to the um, cloud witness. And then something I want to um, go a bit uh, deeper into is um, the um, considerations on the NIC uh, configuration. So um, with um, um, stretch clusters, you can actually use the same physical NICs for um, storage replica traffic and the internal uh, single site storage traffic. And um, the requirement here is um, only that you or your adapters are um, of course sufficiently equipped for this, but also um, teamed with switch embedded teaming. And um, you need to um, create um, single virtual NICs for um, each of the traffic types and they must be assigned dedicated subnets and uh, VLANs of course. 
And uh, we are going to have a look at what that looks like. Um, that's taken um, from the Microsoft um, documentation, actually. So here you can see um, stretch cluster um, over two sides, and we're going to have a look um, at one node in particular, um, how we would configure um, this node or how we have configured them actually in our um, lab environment. So um, basically th this would um, um, yeah, make sure that the, the requirements are um, all, all considered. So um, we have our VSMB, um, so two um, virtual NICs for our local SMB storage uh, traffic. And then we have two virtual interfaces for our um, yeah, storage replic replication traffic, so stretch one and stretch two. And as you can see, we have a um, single physical uh, NIC in here. So in our case, it's a Mellanox um, Connect X4. And um, yeah, this obviously has two ports. And what we are going to do then is to create um, two vir uh, four virtual interfaces and um, to, um, yeah, to make sure that everything is um, configured correctly, we need to enable RDMA on our um, storage NICs on our local storage NICs, but need to disable them on the um, stretched NICs. And uh, we use, um, of course, not routed traffic on the um, local storage NICs, but routed traffic. So I've configured that on the um, NICs that are going to be used for storage replica traffic. And of course, in the end, what is also um, recommended is to do a, um, adapter teaming or team mapping. Um, so that means that we are going to map the adapters, the, the virtual adapters to the physical ones. So we have the VSMB1 and the stretch one being mapped to the PNIC1 and uh, the, the other ones to the PNIC2. Okay, enough of the talking. Um, so let's start with um, some demo content here. Mm, um, because Carsten has shown uh, some parts and Manfred as well, I'm uh, trying to um, cut this demo a bit short by jumping to the relevant uh, um, steps. So um, this shows Windows Admin Center creation with the um, yeah with the wizard of a stretch cluster. And um, what is important here is that when you create a, a new cluster, as we're going to do this here, um, you will choose Azure Stack HCI, obviously, and then have your servers in two sites. Um, so they are stretched across two sites. And then, of course, we are going to add our servers. And um, this has been sped up a bit, so uh, we do, do not need to sit and wait, but you will see, so this is um, obviously Azure Stack HCI on real hardware, so our primer GRX 2540. And uh, yeah, while well, we are going to add our nodes, uh, we are waiting, and um, these are all validated um, now and we can use them. So I've prepared um, also a bit of stuff here. And so here, what is important that um, we have the storage replica module installed, obviously, because we need that to um, replicate our volumes later on. So um, that's also a minor difference compared to single site cluster deployments. OK, so from here, I would like to jump to the um, next step, which must be here. So here we have um, our network adapters and um, I also have prepared them in advance and I would recommend everyone um, to do so as well. If you have a um, yeah, more complex setup of network adapters, I think it's, it's easier to configure them in advance with PowerShell and then just uh, skip through the wizard here. Um, so here you can see what I've shown you earlier. So we have our two um, SMB NICs, and then we have the um, storage replica NICs, and uh, they are using our um, Mellanox adapters. And uh, then I've, I've also configured um, adapters for our Hyper-V traffic and, and the management traffic, of course. 
Okay, so this was uh, another thing that I wanted to show you, and then I will jump right ahead to um, this point in time where, um, yeah, the, the biggest difference uh, is shown. So basically here we are going to create the sites, so the, the cluster fault domains, and we assign our nodes to the two sites. So that's done pretty easily and goes pretty fast. And after that, it's just the usual steps, but you will notice that, um, for example, um, S2D will take a bit longer, so the enable S2D part will take a bit longer than in a usual uh, single site deployments um, because um, there are simply more tasks um, to, to do, which uh, we are going to have a look at later on. So again, this is heavily sped up. So uh, we do not have the, the long waiting times, um, but in, if you would compare it in real time, you would see that um, this, this takes much longer than on a um, yeah, normal, normal S2D cluster, Azure Stack HCI cluster. Okay, with that, I'm going to jump over to the next slide, um, which is actually the next uh, demo video, which will just show what we have configured here or what um, we will have after we um, created our cluster. So we have our two pools, which I've shown you earlier. So site one, site two, and we have four volumes in there already. Um, although it's only one volume that we want to use or are using. Um, so this is our um, automatically created cluster performance history volume. And you can see that we have um, the source defined here, um, the, the source log, destination and destination log. So our um, direction goes from site two um, to, uh, from site one to site two. So this is the direction in which we are replicating here which we you will see um, when we move to the storage uh, replica tab. So um, because I freshly deployed this cluster, what I have also done, I just checked if everything was fine with our um, Fujitsu integrations or the Windows Admin Center extension. So this is the server view health extension from which you can um, check a lot of things um, on a hardware level. So you have basically um, single um, point of yeah, a single pane of glass uh, where you where you can uh, have a look at your your server and see if everything is working correctly. So uh, here it shows only green ticks, which is good. So, uh, but but I I also had it that a, like a fan was failing or so, and then you would instantly um, see a warning here. Okay, and now, as promised, our storage uh, replica partnerships that were created by the Windows Admin Center. So, uh, as mentioned, this is the, the direction here from um, our site one to site two for our cluster performance history volume, which was all uh, created automatically. Nothing else that we had to do other than uh, clicking through the uh, cluster creation wizard. Okay, and now um, how would the installation be different if we would have used um, PowerShell instead of the Windows Admin Center? So um, basically after the cluster creation and before enabling storage spaces direct, you um, would have needed to run a um, couple of commands. Um, so first of all, um, you had to um, set or create a new cluster fault domain. Um, so site one in our case and the fault domain type is site. And then as a next step, um, you would have um, assigned the nodes, so the, the children to the parents, so the nodes to the site in this case. And um, then another optional thing to do is to set a preferred site. This is also quite interesting because um, with the preferred site, um, you um, have a couple of um, benefits or different behavior in case there's an um, yeah, outage or your witness um, can't be reached um, during a um, yeah, disaster or when a site goes down. Because on the one hand, uh, um, 
yeah, with the, with the dynamic quorum and the, the rating of the other side, so the not preferred side is being decreased. Um, this ensures that the uh, um, preferred side stays online um, if everything else is equal. And in a split brain scenario where your witness cannot be contacted from either side and uh, sides cannot uh, contact each other. So let's say we have side one with two nodes, side two with two nodes. Um, it's always the case um, that the preferred side will win the vote even if both sides have two votes and we do not have a tiebreaker. Um, so the, the preferred side is automatically um, set to win the vote, um, which is um, kind of a benefit if you want to have this um, scenario or if you want to make sure of that. And then what would we do after the installation? So what hasn't been done by the cluster creation so far? Um, we need to register our cluster with Azure, obviously. Um, then as the next step, um, we need to set a cloud or file share witness. Um, we are going to set a file share witness, but yeah, Azure cloud witness is also perfectly fine and valid option. And then yeah, some things I, I call it housekeeping here. And um, so um, it's always good to rename your cluster networks because you have lots of cluster networks in a um, replicated scenario. And also, if not yet happened, um, assign VLANs and map the uh, virtual NICs to the physical NICs. And uh, yeah, optionally, you can set a preferred site, um, exclude any networks from live migration, and set live migration and storage replica um, options such as bandwidth limit. I think uh, Carsten also um, showed the command uh, for that earlier on. So let's go that uh, let, let's uh, have a look at that in uh, our on our live uh, demo system or on our, our demo system. So um, this is what I was talking about when I meant uh, the, the network adapter team mapping. So we are mapping the virtual NICs to the physical maps uh, live here or in, in action. Um, and then we are going to enable RDMA on our um, SMB NICs and disable them on the on the stretch NICs. Then as a next step, uh, just um, yeah, seeing that everything was configured correctly, getting our cluster configuration, um, get our S2D configuration here, and um, then have another look at the storage pool. And we will also see here that we have um, two storage pools created. Um, we will use them later on. So um, yeah, that's interesting to keep their, their name in mind. Um, and then we see that we have the cluster fault domains, which were also configured by the Windows Admin Center. So that's what I meant earlier, the children we have here, and then we have basically the parent here with the different sites, um, which are our fault domains. And the Windows Admin Center has not set a preferred site, and uh, also I haven't done that. Um, so yeah, just confirming the settings here. And then as a next step, um, setting the, the quorum, so our file share witness. And then after that, what I have promised to you is um, setting the cluster network names. So you will see that right here that it can be really confusing if you have like nine networks and they are all named network uh, one to nine. And um, so we are going to name them based on their address. And we can also see that our metrics are fine here because um, we have the um, lowest metrics for our SMB networks, which means they are being used first. And then um, we have the um, storage replica um, networks next and the management networks. Network is basic, or it is um, actually the last one. Um, so um, that's that's all fine. Okay, I've talked about um, the volumes uh, earlier on, and I think also Carsten did. So um, I try to keep it short here. For each volume that we want to create, we need essentially um, four 
um, volumes. So in each side we have a data volume and a log volume. Um, so multiplied by two, that makes four volumes. And we can have different um, configurations. So we can either have a synchronous scenario where um, every incoming write is um, yeah, coming in, then uh, written to the log of this server cluster, and then also at the same time announced to the other side, written in the log, and then it's acknowledged, and um, only then it's acknowledged back to the application. And uh, after that, it's written to the data volume. And the difference in an asynchronous scenario is that we um, yeah, write the data to the log volume on our um, local cluster first, and then um, yeah, have this already acknowledged to um, our application, um, and then um, announce it to the other side, where it's written into the log, acknowledged, and then written to the data volume. So um, yeah, let's have a quick look at the cluster creation in the Windows Admin Center. Um, this is yeah, just a very simple use case. And then after that, I want to um, show that in, in the PowerShell with the um, commands, which is a bit more complex, as you can see. And I think uh, then you can appreciate what the Windows Admin Center actually does for you. Um, so that's that's pretty nice, I think. Um, so we can select a di direction. We can say synchronous or asynchronous, um, select the size and also the resiliency level. And then again, this is heavily sped up, but you will see um, our first volume being created. Then as the next one, the log volume on our um, primary side, which is side two in this case, and then uh, everything else is going to happen on the um, other side as well, so the um, side one in this case. Obviously, depending on the direction which we chose first. And we can see that the storage replica partnership was created for us as well without uh, having to do anything else. So here is the um, initial block copy happening. Um, so you can track the progress here. It's just a small volume just for demo purposes. And then before going into the, the PowerShell um, volume creation, um, I want to talk about briefly about um, the, the log volume because I haven't shown that in the, in the demo video. So you can go to the advanced section where you can define the log volume size actually. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, this, this can be adjusted by you, but there is no general rule for sizing these log volumes. Um, so the, the dependence there is basically um, the larger the, the volume is, the large or the longer you can tolerate outages um, because the data goes into your log volume. And if the other side comes back, so if it has failed uh, previously and then comes back, um, you can replicate directly from one log volume to the other. But if um, the first log volume has uh, filled up already and needs to discard data, then um, you need to um, yeah, have a different replay mechanism to um, restore the log data, basically. Um, so um, that's the benefit you get from a, from a larger log volume. And we have seen um, in, in the real world that um, yeah, larger log volumes can, can really help you to um, speed up this uh, re synchronizing process in the end. So log volumes also benefit from, large, uh, from, from faster storage. So Carsten also mentioned that um, you, you want to have flash storage there. Um, for, for your log volumes and the log volumes must not be used for any other things than, uh, than the log. Um, so that's, that's not supported. And if you want to have deeper um, or more recommendations, you can also run a test SR topo topology commandlet. Um, that one can give you a um, couple of um, recommendations. And uh, there's also a section in the free 
frequently asked uh, question sections. Um, so in the, in the Microsoft Docs, if you are wondering about the log volume, you can also go there and uh, check the documentation out. OK, moving on now to the um, to the volume creation with PowerShell and you can see I have prepared a longer script here. So I'm going to start with our um, disk names and um, just to show you this is the disk name we are going to create. So our demo stretched volume one. And in order to start, we first um, move our available storage resource or cluster group to node one because um, that's the replication direction we want to achieve. So from site one uh, to site two. So we are moving the available storage group there and creating our volumes there. So two volumes, uh, we have seen that scheme before. Um, so the, the original volume and the log volume. And after that, we are going to stop um, the um, cluster group available storage and move it to the site two. Um, so it's node three here. Um, so in, in my naming, it would be a node one in site two. And then we do basically the same. So we create our two volumes there. So you can also see that we specify the pool name here. Um, so for our storage pool. So we have the pool for site one and we have the pool for site two. So we are going to put our volumes there. And after we have done that, we move back our um, available storage cluster group. And then we do um, a quick check whether everything has been created. So um, get cluster resources. Um, we can see that we have four volumes now, which are called demo stretched volume 01, then the log volume, replica and replica log volume. For our volume 01, we are going to create a um, cluster shared volume or add a cluster shared, shared volume, which we are going to start after that. And also move it to um, node one because um, that's where I want the volume to reside. And then I also start the cluster resources for the um, disk, uh, for, for the log disk. That's where I um, deviate a bit from the um, original Microsoft documentation, and I will soon explain why. Um, so you can see there would be the, um, the script for testing the uh, storage replica topology, which I haven't done here. Um, but I'm going to create a storage replica partnership now um, with our volumes. Um, so I have to specify the names for our um, for our resource groups, and um, then I have to specify the the path to our volumes. Um, in a Microsoft documentation, you will often find that they use the um, that they use the drive letters. Um, I have found that. Um, the drive letters are sometimes discarded after moving the available storage group around. Um, so that's the reason why I use paths instead of um, the, the drive letters. And you will see my first try failing here, um, which I have, le uh, have left in there uh, intentionally because um, I've encountered that a couple of times and I've noticed that if I'm going to do it this way, then I also need to start um, the, the cluster resources or the cluster resource for um, both the other disks. So I'm going to do that and then you will see that everything is working as expected and we can create a new storage replica partnership. So running this command again. And then you will see that uh, this, this will work. And then what we are going to do as the last step while this is uh, doing its job, um, we will 
create uh, or set a storage replica network constraint where we specify um, for each site um, which interfaces we want to use. So you can see here um, that we use the name of our cluster networks that we have defined earlier. So uh, site one replica one, site two replica two, uh, site, site one replica two, and then for, for our destination, um, the, the site two replica networks. So we are going to set that. And in the next step, um, just confirming what we have created so far. So that's right after I have created um, everything. So let's view the groups. We have six groups here, which makes sense because we have the cluster performance history volume. Then we have one volume for our um, uh, one group for our volume that we created in um, so two groups for our volumes that we created with Windows Admin Center and two groups for our um, volume that we have created with um, PowerShell. So next one is the Storage Replica Partnership. We now have three of those. So cluster performance history, um, the demo stretched volume, and the one created with the Windows Admin Center. And last but not least, the network constraint, which we just defined. And once again, you can see here, we have specified the network interfaces, which we want to use um, for um, this uh, storage replica group, basically. On the next slide, on the next demo video, you would see the result, but I think we can uh, skip that as I still have uh, more interesting content to come um, because the next part is about affinity rules and affinity rules um, basically define um, rules for our virtual machines. And we can define with the affinity rules whether we want to keep them together on um, one node one side or even if we want to um, have them in different sites or different nodes, whatever you want. So you can see here I have created a couple of virtual machines and I can configure the affinity rules with the Windows Admin Center. Just uh, go to the settings, affinity rules, then assign a name, the rule type. So four different rule types together or apart same site, same server, different site, different servers. And then choose the VMs which this rule should apply to. And then we create a rule and then we are good to go. And you can now or could now delete the rule or create a new one. And now the same for PowerShell because I promised I would show you how to do everything in PowerShell as well. A um, couple of more steps again. So we create our affinity rule, um, create or specify the type which we want to use, and then we add our virtual machines. And what we can do as well, which we can also do with the Windows Admin Center, is to add cluster shared volumes to this group as well, uh, to this rule as well. So um, I'm doing that right here, as you can see. And then one additional benefit that PowerShell has, you can enable and disable the rules and change the rule type. I haven't seen that in Windows Admin Center. So um, if we get the rule type now, we can see um, it's set to the same fault domain, so same site. And if we are going to set it now to same node, then it's being changed. Okay, that's um, I think pretty easy and simple. So um, as a as a last demo, which I have brought, um, there is a very small failover scenario. Do, do not expect too much. Um, but yeah, this this is a demo scenario for our four node cluster, um, where you can see I have the watch cluster script running here, and our all of our virtual machines are running inside two. And I will make site to fail by um, shutting down both nodes in site two. So you can already see that happening right here. So node two in site two is lost 
node one also gets lost and this is just a ping to to one of the virtual machines that is running so um just to keep track on uh when when this comes back up again so you can look at the time so it's 9:38 right now in the in the demo so um yeah we can uh count the time until the um, machine comes back up so this is um sped up a bit and i think at 9:40 or 9:39 already yeah we can see um starting the iops to increase on our um Side one, so everything has failed uh, to side one. We can that also uh, we can also see that here on the owner nodes, and our virtual machine is coming up again. And then if I move a bit ahead, um, I think we can see that at some point our storage jobs start to kick in. So in the meantime, I have. Yeah, that, that's where the storage drops uh, start to come in. So um, in the meantime, I have actually restarted both of the nodes. So it's 946 here and uh, we can see that um, our rebuild or repair jobs have started. Um, so yeah, now the, the volumes are being repaired. Okay, so much for the demo cases and now um, a yeah, bit more um, view on our Fujitsu Prime Flex offering before I uh, finish off and close the session. Um, so first of all, you already have seen uh, our um, Windows Admin Center integration. So um, we had seen the um, extension for our server view health um, program or application or agent, I should say. And um, then we also um, have the um, server view rate manager. Um, so extension for that, where you can see um, the, the rate uh, disks and also the um, yeah, NVM, uh, PCI Express cards. And um, then for those of you who may use our Fujitsu software infrastructure manager because of a yeah, more complex data center, lots of different servers there, um, where it makes sense to um, use the ISM appliance. Um, there you um, also have the possibility to, to use one of our extensions, so um, the extension for ISM. And then also um, we have the, the cluster where updating coming um, for for um, our server view agents um, so that's something to look forward to and here's some yeah already quick uh, mock-up how it can uh, look like so um, yeah stay stay tuned for that I do not know the timeline uh, from the top of my head but um, I think that's uh, something to look forward to um, definitely so um, about our Fujitsu Prime Flex offering, um, what what are the highlights there? So I think uh, most importantly um, is the reduced um, deployment risk for our customers, um, because on the one hand, as the other vendors, we um, certify um, our hardware with um, Azure Stack HCI separately. Um, so um, the, the customers can just pick a node or whole cluster from the Azure Stack HCI catalog. And to complement that, we have um, our Fujitsu web architect where you can configure um, our solutions uh, via web interface. Um, so um, that's, that's also pretty easy to use. And then of course we um, offer um, yeah, uh, best practices guides and design and implementation guides um, for those installing the um, solutions um, via the, the so-called implementation packs, which we offer to customers um, in order to make sure that they um, have a best practice configuration installed. So um, yeah, that, that also reduces um, the risk at the customer side and of course, uh, 
it, it means that customers do not need to build up that much knowledge because um, we as Fujitsu could take over that part or offer that to the customers. Um, of course, we um, have a very holistic view on, on infrastructure, so we do not only sell our integrated systems, but have offerings that concern Azure, for example. We can build hybrid solutions with Azure Arc. And um, also nice thing um, regarding the implementation pack is that we um, enable our partners and customers with our own um, Fujitsu PrimeFlex trainings. We have one specifically for Storage Spaces Direct, and we have um, uh, or are working on uh, building one for Azure Stack or creating one for Azure Stack HCI as well. So much for that, and then also just as a, as a short head, heads up um, that our M6 generation is approaching fast. Um, so we are currently still um, working out the details of how we um, uh, how we are going to use them in our um, integrated systems. Um, but yeah, be assured there will be integrated systems based on the um, uh, prime flex systems based on um, our M6 generation, um, making use of all the new um, features and functionalities that we can offer with the M6 generation. So um, that is being worked on right now, and hopefully um, we will see the we will uh, be seeing the results very soon. So with that, I'd like to wrap, wrap up the session. So what are the key takeaways from today's session? Or at least I hope that these are the key takeaways for you. Um, so we have talked about stretch cluster requirements, have uh, repeated what um, Carsten said and um, also made uh, another point uh, yeah, to, to look specifically at networking and the witness um, because we have seen in projects that this is really important. Um, then uh, I've shown you the stretch cluster setup, and I think the key takeaway here is that Windows Admin Center does a nice job in taking off um, all the necessary tasks and responsibilities of you. Um, but if you want most flexibility, want to have scripted tasks and so on, then of course PowerShell is the way to go. And um, as, as always, Microsoft documentation is your friend. Uh, when it comes to, to using PowerShell and building Azure Stack HCI clusters. So with that, I'm finished, uh, almost on time. So thanks everyone for joining. Again, uh, thanks Carsten and Manfred. Uh, thanks for having us and me here. Um, so looking forward to, to any questions that uh, may, may have come in. <clears throat> So Fabian, very detailed and very great session. You had much more in your presentations than I had. Um, great. Uh, of course, I know all this stuff, but I didn't want to go too deep, but you had the chance to add to the session that we already have. So I have a question here from the audience. Um, I just read it out. Are there any time horizon when proactive LCM support will be released for PrimeFlex S2D solutions. So they are especially asking for storage basis direct solutions, not for Azure Stack HCI. Yeah, I know that we have lots of uh, S2D solutions um, in, in the field, so uh, I can understand this ask, obviously. And so proactive, um, I yeah, I, I cannot comment on that actually. Um, do not do not know of anything. Uh, but yeah, hopefully the, um, the clusterware updating integration um, takes off some of the pain that, that will come soon. So um, I hope that that is a benefit. I, I do not know the timeline of this either, but um, it's definitely coming. Yeah. Okay, I don't see more questions, but I I, I want to uh, comment something. It's it's not uh, it's not about yet Prime Flex, but I, but I had a, a very lengthy discussion in the Q and A uh, with a uh, with attendee about storage spaces direct and stretch clusters, and there is quite there are quite some misconceptions. So if it's okay for you, I would state some comments here because it's sure. just just. Uh, helping with the topic with Azure Stack HCI uh, and Stretch Cluster. So uh, Azure Stack HCI, there's official support for the Stretch Cluster scenario. We have uh, 
Fabian pointed out, we have two pools. So uh, on every side, we have all our data completely in that side. So it's not spread over the sides. We have our uh, re resiliency in the side. So if we have two nodes in each side, a four node cluster, we have uh, two way mirror. If we have three or four nodes in each side, you can have a three way mirror and we can have up to two a server uh, fading out per site with a three way mirror. With Storage Spaces Direct, there is no support from Microsoft for a stretch cluster. There, uh, we can misuse the storage concept with a two node cluster or a four node cluster to build a stretched cluster that is residing in two sites. But we have to be very careful about the network. In essence, you need four switches, two per site for the resiliency, and you can't extend an, a stretch storage basis direct cluster with four nodes to six nodes or eight nodes because the maximum of failure you can have in a storage basis direct cluster without changing the fault domains is two fault domains. So in, in, a, in essence, two nodes. So if you have a six node cluster, three on each side and one side fails, so three nodes fail, you have failures of three fault domains and a three-way mirror will not survive that. So uh, it, it, the, it's even worse. Uh, you you don't own, not only have one volume with problems, all volumes have problems. So all volumes are offline. They are not complete anymore. They are a lot of 256 megabytes extend missing. So if you do a stretch cluster, and I, I confess we have done around 100 storage bases, direct stretch clusters for customers. All of the customers knows, knows there is no Microsoft support for that. So you can't call Microsoft, my stretch cluster has a problem. My stretch S2D cluster has a problem. But if you are very careful with four nodes, you can misuse the, um, the fault domain concept to do that. But you have to be very careful and uh, we need stretch clusters, at, especially in Germany. We are the, the country of stretch, stretching everything. And there, Azure Stack HCI is the supported solution. And there are also, uh, you saw it in Fabian's session, there are many requirements with networks. No, um, they have to have routed replica networks. We don't have to have other traffic on those routed networks. We have to, to use uh, storage replica network constraints. So we have to redirect our replication traffic over those networks. I'm implementing st uh, stretch clusters in the moment at some customers and there are many requirements. So stretching uh, independent of every any technology is not easy. It's not just set it up and it works. You have to to think of many things here. So I'm not going over time. So I, I want, just want to clarify that you can, you can, you are not allowed to from Microsoft support, but you can stretch a storage, st stretch a storage basis direct cluster, but only four nodes or two nodes, or you play around with the fault domains. So if you have, for example, two, eight, to a 60 node cluster, you can put eight nodes in one uh, side and eight nodes in the other, and then, then you have to change the fault domain to site. So you have basically two fault domains, one in site one A, one in site B. But now if one disk fails in one of the eight nodes in site A and one disk fails in one of the eight nodes in site B, you are doomed. Yeah? And that uh, I have, <laughs> I've done, I think a webinar about this. Many people assume if I just have 60 nodes um, and I put them in two sides, eight nodes can fail. That's not the truth. Even with a non-stretch 60 node S2D cluster, only two nodes can fail. Not three, not four, not five, nothing more than two nodes. And that's only true with a three-way mirror and um, a mirror accelerated parity or a double parity volume. With a two-way mirror, only one node can fail. And that's very important. No? Sorry, sorry, Fabian, because I, I got this misconception many times. So 
uh, Microsoft technology is like magic. It will help with anything. No, you have to really to know what to do, especially with a stretch cluster. But Carsten, I think the misunderstanding starts already earlier, but we don't have enough time to discuss this now. But maybe we have later on the, on the round table, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, on the round table, because um, it depends on what you need. In a cluster, you can lose, if you have 60 nodes, 15, and something stays online, your cluster service. But let's discuss this later. <laughs> Yeah, nice okay. job. So thank you Fabian so much. It was a very good uh, presentation. I liked it a lot uh, and I hope uh, the people get a lot of out of it. And thank you uh, for you two to being sponsor at this event.